to Romans 3, verse 21. Here is the gospel. Put your finger right there in verse 21. If you have a pen, mark verse 21. Before I read it, let me read you this. What things soever the law says, it says to them who are within its sphere of jurisdiction. Why? That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. How extensive then is the jurisdiction of the law? It includes every soul in the world. There is no one who is exempt from obedience to it. There is not a soul whom it does not declare to be guilty. The law is the standard of righteousness and there is none righteous, no, not one. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. One of two things must be the case whenever a man is justified by the law. Namely, either the man is not guilty, or else the law is a bad law. But neither of these things is true in this case. For God's law is perfectly righteous, and all men are sinners. By the law is the knowledge of sin. It is obvious that a man cannot be declared righteous by the same law that declares him to be a sinner. Think about that. Think about that, because then we're going to read his verse. Okay? It is obvious that a man cannot be declared righteous by the same law that declares him to be a sinner. This is what Jesus was trying to teach the Pharisees. You think you're clean on the outside. And you have these things that have the law on your, yeah, well, their clothing, you know what I'm saying? And then they have them so they can look at it at the beginning of the day and look at it at the end of the day. And if they say, hey, I didn't kill nobody today, I'm good with God. I didn't steal nobody's goods, I'm good with God. And they thought that was good. They only cared about the outside appearance. Christ was telling them, God looks motives. He looks at the heart and this is what you need is a heart transplant. So again, it is obvious that a man cannot be declared righteous by the same law that declares him to be a sinner. Therefore, it is a self-evident truth that by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified. Does that make sense to you guys now? There is a double reason why no one can be justified by the law. The first is that all have sinned, therefore the law must continue to declare them guilty, no matter what their future life might be. No man can ever do more than his duty to God, and no possible amount of good deeds can undo one wrong act. One. But more than this, men have not only sinned, but they are <coughs> sinful. The condition. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's Romans 8 7. Galatians 5 17 says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are what? Contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Therefore, no matter how much a man may try to do right, the righteousness of the law, he will fail to find justification by it. The law can never justify. It was never its purpose to justify. Amen. So, now, verse 21. Do you see the condition? I hope so, because we spent a lot of time on this. There's our condition. What do we do? Here is God stepping into our plight and our problem and saying, here is the solution. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of who? Is God righteous? Is there a more perfect righteousness than God himself? So listen to this and think of what this is saying. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, because the law can never give you righteousness, is now revealed, being witnessed by what? How can this righteousness be witnessed by the law and the prophets? Because as we've been telling you from the Sabbath school class and from the pulpit, that there has only been one true gospel, and that gospel has been preached from the fall of Adam, to our day today. There is one way to heaven, and that way is Jesus 
Christ. When God set up for the nation of Israel the sanctuary service, He never told them that the blood of animals will save you. He never told them that this service will save you. The problem was, is they looked at the service for salvation. Instead of what it symbolized, they lost sight of Christ. They perverted the gospel. Isn't that the same thing that happened in the book of Galatians? Right? Think about it, right? This is what Satan has done from the fall till our day today, is to get you to take your eyes off of Christ, the only way of salvation. So God says, now I have made a way for you to be righteous, and that way is Jesus Christ. And in Him is a complete and perfect righteousness that you cannot add anything to. You bring nothing. I brought everything. All you do is open the door. Let Christ come in. Let him have your hearts. Now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Let me read this. Let no one imagine that in the gospel he can ignore the law of God. The righteousness of God, which is manifested apart from the law, is witnessed by the law. It is such righteousness as the law witnesses to and commends. It must be so because it is the righteousness which Christ revealed. And that came from the law which was in his heart. So although the law of God has no righteousness to impart to any man, it does not cease to be the standard of righteousness. This is why God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is one of the reasons why we're here. To proclaim and put back the truth of God... His law, what we're called to, what He's going to do in us. Amen? Amen? There can be no righteousness that does not stand the test of the law. You say, not you, I speak as a man. <clears throat> you say, I'm no longer under the law, I'm saved by grace. And I say, yes, I am saved by grace, but what am I saved for? I'm saved for good works. Righteous deeds from the creation of the world. God has created us to do His will. And His will is righteous acts. But I have no righteousness in me. How can I do that? And that is answered by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is no longer I that try to do these things because I can't. But it is Christ living in me. The hope of the Lord. Does that make sense? That's the gospel, brothers and sisters. Listen to this. The righteousness of God Oh, let me read this. Where is the righteousness manifested? Where? Why, of course, where it needs to be manifested the most. Inside of you and me. You thought about that? This is what Christ gives us. Where is the righteousness manifested? Of course, where it needs to be manifested the most in people, in you and I. That is, in a certain class described in the next verse, but it does not originate in them. The scriptures have already shown us that no righteousness can come from man. The righteousness of God is manifested in Jesus Christ. He himself said through the prophet David, this is uh, Psalm 40, verses 8 and 9. Does this sound familiar to you? I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is where? Within my heart, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. O oh Lord, thou knowest. So let no one imagine that in the gospel we can ignore the law of God. The righteousness of God, which is manifested apart from the law, is witnessed by the law. And it is such righteousness as the law witnesses to and commends. It must be so because it is the righteousness which Christ revealed. And that came from the law, which was in his heart. So although the law of God has no righteousness to impart to any man, it does not cease to be the standard of righteousness. There can be no righteousness that does not stand the test of the law. 
For the law of God must put its seal of approval upon everyone who enters heaven. Ooh, did you get that last verse? The law of God must put its seal of approval upon everyone who enters heaven. When Peter preached Christ to Cornelius and his family, he said in Acts 10, 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believes in him shall receive remissions of sin. Peter's talking about Jesus Christ. And the prophets is the Old Testament. The prophets preached the same gospel that the apostles did. See 1 Peter 1.12. There is but one foundation, and that is the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. This also suggests another thought about witness by the law. It is not simply that the righteousness which is manifested in Christ is approved by the law, but it is actually proclaimed in the law. In the portion of scripture specifically known as the law, the portion written by Moses, Christ is preached. Moses was a prophet, and therefore he testified of Christ. For Jesus said in John 5, 46, what? For he wrote of me. Amen. Do you understand? Do you see the deception that is in a lot of the churches today? Mm -hmm. Dispensationalism? And all that goes with that? That these people were saved this way, these people are saved this way, and when we get to heaven, it's all going to be different, it's going to go back to this way. Okay? There's been one way. Amen. Christ has been preached from Genesis to Revelation, from beginning to end. So again, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22, here he says it again, even the righteousness of God. Isn't that what we need? We need the righteousness of God. How do we attain it? Through faith in Jesus Christ. For who? Well, to all and on all, because God is no respecter of persons. Don't you love that? Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. Why is there no difference? Verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? His righteousness. His character. What He wants to see manifested in us. We fall short. But God has taken care of that problem. God has taken care of the condition of sin. God, through Christ, has said, I will conquer in their flesh what they can never conquer themselves. Amen? Amen. I can give them a hope and a life and a future that outside of me they can never have. I will be their surety. I will guarantee their salvation. This is why, if you're in Christ's hands, no one can take you out. Amen? Amen? Amen. Is that good news? Yeah. Really? Amen. You don't seem too excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, this is what we're here for. My time here as a pastor is, is quickly drawing to a close. And there's so there's so much that I want to share with you, and so much I want to tell you, but everything can just be boiled down into very few words. And that is that you understand who Jesus Christ is, that you understand what He has done for you, that you access the power that He gives by understanding what it means to have the faith of Jesus. And that we don't just come to church week after week after week to hear a sermon and then go out into the world and never think about it again. You come here to recharge your batteries, to learn more about Christ so you can go out into the world and show them who He really is. What He's done for you. That He's real. People look at us and go, well, you don't have any more power than I do, so why should I believe in your Christ? 
Is that a true statement? Yeah. What's going to make that difference? What's going to make that difference is when we start to grasp these concepts and start to put into our lives the faith of Jesus. Let Him live in us. Ask in His love for you. You realize it never goes away. That it never changes. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does that mean? That means that He has known you before you were born, knew everything you were going to do to the day you died, or He came back, and He has loved you with an everlasting love. Through it all. Nothing will change that. He knocks at the door of your heart. He wants you to let Him in. And if you let Him in, He will change your life. And He will give you a power that you will never receive from anywhere else in this world. Amen? Amen. Closing hymn is number 418. Oh, hold on. Can you guys give me like three more minutes? Yes. Yeah. I want to play a song for you. And that's all. There's a song I want to play. But can you go ahead and cue that up? Listen to the words. Listen to the words of the song. Himself, day. 
with our heads. Heavenly Father, as we end this service, Lord, I pray that we will leave here changed. Pray that what has been said here will not just be my words, for they have no power in them. But what I pray, Father, is that your spirit will touch the ears, will touch the minds, touch the hearts of those that are sitting here. That as we leave here and we go through our week, our minds will be focused on Jesus Christ. That we will realize that we have a power that's available to us, for God is more willing to give us His Spirit than we are willing to ask. Father, I ask and I pray for Your Holy Spirit. But I also pray that You prepare us to receive that Spirit. Help us to put away all these worldly things that separate us from you, that diminish your power working in us. Father, I pray that you will change us. God, you've done many, many marvelous things in this church. You've answered all of our prayers. And Lord, as I get ready to step down, I pray that you will continue to bless this church with your presence, with your truth, that you will raise up men and women and children who will stand for what is right. Even though it's not easy, even though the world is saying if you bring in an easier message, if you change your music style, you change your worship style, make it more thrilling, make it more appealing to the people, you'll get lots of people. Father, help us to focus on what you have called us to do Help us to be true to that calling. Give us the power to see. Help us to be able to discern truth from deception. Help us to see Jesus. For this I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.